Hello, salvete, hello. What I'm going to do today is speak about a rather extraordinary organization. Um, and this will involve a slight historical overview and um, then a projection of a big event that is to come. The uh, Academia Latinitati Fowendi was the result of several projects after the Second World War to not merely foster the use of Latin, but to revive its active use. And um, this is going to be a very brief overview of the history. Uh, you can find on the Academy's website, you, all you need to do is Google uh, ALF, or better yet, Academia Latinitati Fowendi, and you'll find uh, uh, its website. And there is, under Historia, uh, the website is a Latin website. If you just bear with me a moment here. Um, you can find an overview of this history. But most of my information comes from a book that has actually been written about the Academy by uh, Guy Lecoq, who is a longtime lover of Latin. And he is not an academic. He's a medical doctor. And he lives in Brussels, or did live in Brussels. Now he lives in the country. And he has um, a foundation called Melissa, which produces a Latin periodical. Uh, and he was one of the original believers in Latin as kind of a, uh, what do you want to say, a, a common um, bond of Europeans after the disaster, of course, of World War II. And uh, he has written a book on the history of the Academy, which is available through the Foundation Melissa. So this is necessarily very brief, but here goes. In the 1950s and early 1960s, several elements coalesced that resulted in this academy. A catalyst was the premier, uh, premier congrès international pour le latin vivant, celebrated at Avignon, France, in 1956. This conference, it seems, was inspired by the ideas of Jean, che uh, Jean Capel, who was a professor at the University of Nancy. Um, in France, and he was a professor of a discipline allied to classics, but not. I think an engineer. Engineer, yeah, right, right, that's right, you're right. And he advocated, he was, he, he thought, dreamed about Latin revival of Latin as the universal language, as the language of the European community, this sort of official language, to go back to the Renaissance, which of course was something that was never going to happen. But it did have other effects that uh, Capel never thought of. Um, this was the first event of its kind, and certainly on this scale, to have taken place outside the Roman Catholic Church since the Second World War. And uh, in this first Living Latin Conference, which was entirely in Latin, 200 people took part. And they came from many countries. They included professors, teachers, members of the Catholic Church, and some other individuals um, outside the ecclesiastical or academic arena who uh, were devotees of Latin. The projects were grandiose. Creation of a new lexicon um, of modern Latin. The reformation of Latin teaching to serve a universal and stable language. This is the other virtue of Latin. It adds new words, but its syntax remains stable, which is true. Those who want to think that Latin is just like all the other languages, sometimes me, uh, to me, do not seem to take sufficient account of this difference. The propagation uh, in all Latin teaching circles of all major countries, including Italy and France and Spain, of the restored pronunciation, uh, as reconstructed by German philologists first in the 19th century and then endorsed, really, and codified in the famous 1966 book, Wolk's Latin by Sidney Allen. The continuation of a series of international conferences would also be part of the Encapta on the model of the Avignon one. And um, of all these projects, only the last one actually came to fruition. Because these conferences went on. The Avignon was only the first. Um, and they also, um, at the same time, founded a society, along with the conference in Avignon, 
uh, called Rita Latina. And with the Society was a periodical which survived into the 1980s. The Rita Latina was a living Latin magazine. There were, there were some articles in French as well, but largely in, in Latin. Um, so three more conferences continued by the Societas Rita Latina, um, one of whose guiding members was a remarkable woman who was, again, not a, not a uh, classicist at all, but Genevieve Ime, who uh, married an Italian uh, Latinist, and Latin was their domestic language at home. That was the language they spoke. She was a Latin teacher. She was a Latin teacher. Not a university. Not a university professor. Milena should be giving this talk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Does more than I do. <laughs> but yes, I stand corrected. But Genevieve Ime only recently died. I had the privilege to meet her a lot when I started doing this. An amazing woman. Anyway, so, patrocinante, societate illa, four more, three more conferences. One in 1959, one in 1963, and one in 1966. The last one was held in Rome. The first, the other three were all French, and they were trying for a long time uh, to move it to Italy especially with one of the founders about who I'm going to talk in a moment. The last one, 1966, of these conferences in Rome it was stupendous. It drew 538 participants from 41 countries. That has to be a record for living Latin conferences. It was the hugest event you could imagine. Um, and uh, uh, some believed why this activity at this time? Some people said, and still say, that because of the movement in the Roman Church that resulted in the Second Vatican Council, and some people thought that the results of the Council were to work to the detriment of Latin as the language of the Church, to reducing its role. And I am completely imperitus of that, and so I don't pronounce, I don't know. Um, uh, whether this has any correlation or whether that's even true, because some say that the Second Vatican Council really didn't do that that much. So I don't know. But all I know is that in this space of time, this was an amazing impetus that has its effects down to now. And really, several things arose from these four conferences and the Vita Latina Societas. Some of the energetic personalities behind this Clement Dessessard, who has been a fighter pilot in World War II, uh, Genevieve Ime, uh, uh, Romanelli Eikensir, Calestis Eikensir, um, a Benedictine monk from Germany. Um, they gradually separated into groups. And um, the conferences, uh, for which, they, which gave rise to this, were the sort of springboard from which the week-long seminars for Living Latin started. Uh, in the 70s and 80s and grew, and many of them are still going on. And ours in Lexington grew out of that, because we were inspired, myself, um, by being in those seminars. Uh, and so we descend from that and kept it. The other result of these, this movement in these four conferences was the founding of the academy, the academia. And so here's how it happened. On the last day of the huge Living Latin Conference in Rome in 1966. There was created under the guidance of Pietro Romanelli, who was an archaeologist uh, and a great Lat Fautor Latinitatis Vivae. Uh, he wanted to found the Collegium Latinitati Inter Omnes Gentes Povendae. <coughs> and its members, its first members, were uh, the members of the Academy now can be found. Just a moment. Sodales. There they are. List of uh, about 45 people. Not very many, you see. We'll talk about that in a moment. Soci e ordinari. Anyway, the first one included really great names in Latin studies. Um, uh, Pierre Grimal, Joseph Eswein, the founder of Neo Latin Studies, Johann Irmscher, Casimir Kumaniecki. Jose Maria Mir, who wrote a very useful lexicon of modern Latin. Um, uh, Ettore Paratore, um, Andreas uh, Tierfelder, a medievalist, Jan Wasink, and people like that. These were known philologists. 
Um, and the body was to meet annually in Rome. Um, and by 1970, its name was changed from Collegium to Accademia Latinitati Fowendae. Uh, the site, and so the members meet in Rome. The site of the meeting place has changed several times uh, over the years, as has the administrative structure. Uh, and these changes are explained in detail in Lickhoff's book, A History of It, and, I, and to some extent not very well on this website. Um, but in the book, especially. It's a very interesting book. Um, so, so, but currently, then, I'll skip over that, because currently the academy consists of members at large, an executive council, elected and approved by the membership present at the annual Roman meetings they meet in Rome. Now, because the president is an Austrian philologist, we meet at the uh, school for Roman, the Austrian Academy for Roman Studies in Rome is where we meet. Uh, but its place changes. People become, uh, so the membership, the, the executive council is approved or elected, is elected and then approved by the membership either at the Roman meetings, because not everybody can go, so we can vote by proxy from where we are if we know someone else who's going. So um, they are nominated and approved by the membership. And people become members in the same way by being nominated by other members. Uh, and then it has to be voted on either in person at the Roman meeting or by proxy um, from people who can't make it to the meeting, but they send a representative or ask someone to, to, to do that. Uh, and um, the members then um, of the academy uh, in its early days won grants from the Italian government and from other sources not known to me. Um, and this funding allowed the Academy to sponsor the publication of works about Latin and editions of Latin works. Um, it also enabled the Academy, if you'll bear with me a moment here, because uh, I want to find another part of this website. Uh, yes, here we are. It also enabled the Academy to uh, put on a, a large conference, much like they thought the first Avignon conference, a large conference um, with la pe fautores of Latin from all countries um, uh, that would be celebrated at four-year intervals. And more or less since 1970, this has happened. Sometimes the intervals are not quite four years, but strictly speaking. So the funding allowed the academy to do that uh, at four years. Um, and. Uh, about the purposes of the academy also, I must speak, and that I'm coming to that. Um, but partly, propagation happens through these meetings. You know, people get together, they network, um, and um, they, they take this back to their own places. And there's something about personal meetings, too, that uh, is not replicable through conferences now we can have online and, and things of this kind. So the government funding for the Academy has ceased quite some time ago. So no longer does the Academy regularly sponsor publications or pay for them. Although that, at the time that I speak, has just changed a bit because the Academy now requires from its members an annual fee. And with that money, the Academy has begun again to sponsor some small publication and certainly helping me with the upcoming conference, which I'll talk about. It's still sponsors the quadriennial conference, but most of the funding for these has to be raised by the academy member who is designated that year to organize the conference in her or his country, uh, a region, and more about these conferences in a moment. Uh, also, uh, before I leave this, the, the, the administrative ordo, the academy has an annual meeting in Rome, right, usually in the spring. The executive council sometimes meets twice a year. Uh, and the, the, uh, the annual meetings were a source of an interesting period in the academy's history. Because for uh, the 1980s, most of the meetings were conducted in Italian, not in Latin. Many people in the academy thought it was kind of absurd to keep the use of Latin for absolutely everything, despite the ostensible goal of the academy to promote uh, the Latin as a vehicular language. Um, but for the last 20 years, the Academy has 
returned to its roots, roots and been very strict in keeping Latin as the language of the meeting in Rome. It is, everything happens in Latin. Um, and uh, in this meeting in Rome, now for the most recent time, at the end of the Roman meeting, there's a commenticulum, a small conference, uh, in which papers are given in Latin, and sometimes these are published. Uh, and it's usually on a different theme. This year it will be on uh, utopian themes, utopian, the de optima re publica. Um, in the late 1980s, therefore, and in the early 1990s, there was some dissension in the academy because some members thought the goal of the academy should be more directed towards the promotion of Latin studies rather than promote the use of Latin. And it's fair to say that these, the opinions of those members did not win the day um, because most members felt there were plenty of societies devoted to promoting scholarship or Latin studies, but no international body, no real international body outside the church dedicated to conserving the use of Latin. So the academy then has retained this. And Romanelli and Ime and all those people would be glad because they would see that that purpose has ultimately been saved. Um, the academy has retained that goal. But this in goal embraces and includes not merely the spoken use of Latin, but the continuing, the fostering of the continuing tradition of writing and publishing in Latin, especially the maintenance of Latin as a viable language for scholarship in the humanities, because that has been an unbroken tradition from the Romans to now, that scholarship has been published in Latin. That never completely uh, been broken. Think even of the apparatus or the introduction to your Teubner editions. This is uh, vestiges of, of an old tradition. So the Academy is dedicated to promoting this. And so all the members are, con are, are encouraged to write articles in Latin, which I do. Um, all the quadriennial conferences entirely are entirely Latin events. The only exception was the one held in 1993, which is described here in Leuven and Antwerp, where some papers in the vernacular were permitted. The event was received with disfavor. And so for a change, we see Latin winning. The vernacular just forget it. And ever since then, it's never, that experiment has never been repeated. Uh, between these conferences, then, um, uh, the, 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 they are both scholarly and didactic. There's one stream of didactic sessions, kind of like what we see here, and then one stream of papers. And the papers are typically published. But again, the poor person who has to organize them has to find the funding and means to have them published, <laughs> as well as funding the conference. Um, the conferences are splendid events. Um, between 100 and 200 people from all over the world attend. They've been held in many different regions, including Africa. But, because uh, there was Senkor, who was a, 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 an official in the Nigerian government, was also a fautor, uh, Latinitatis Viva, in the 1970s. And therefore, in Afri in the, the, uh, which one was it? It was in the 70s. One conference in Dakar, in Senegal, in 1971. Yeah. So, but never in North America never in the Americas, and this is going to change. Because in 2017, it will be in Lexington, Kentucky. And we are the poor people who have to raise the money <laughs> and worry about what will happen with the papers. So we'll see. Um, and um, so in a nutshell, that's it. And I, uh, tempus fugit, ergo satis quito loquendum est, et ad finem properandum, what happens at the conferences? They are open to all Latinists, not just members. Um, and um, papers on a wide variety of topics of interest to Latinists given by all kinds of speakers, some distinguished, but they all must be in Latin. So you're all invited. And you will not believe when I tell you what the theme, because there's usually a theme, but very broadly interpreted, uh, what the theme of the 2017 conference will be. And any guesses? De itineribus. De itineribus. Yeah. <laughs> De itineribus. And go, Codamodo potuisti o facere quid in animo haberemus. It was the orbe novo, but we didn't want also to exclude some people that. Yeah. Because, especially because of what you said in the introductory speech about the itinerary that are now going on, there is material there. 
although there's a preference for itinera that have been recorded in text because the idea of promoting scholarship is always with us. But nothing is excluded. So anyway, um, there are also excursions. And that's a challenge for us to find something that might interest our European. Um, there are very interesting things around Lexington that not many people know about. But uh, there's whiskey, you know. <laughs> 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 horses, horses. horses. But uh, we, uh, we're going to exercise our ingenia and come up with uh, itinera. There is performance of a Latin play, which nearly always happens. And the field of neo-Latin drama is an unexplored treasure. If you look at the journal, Humanistica Lovaniencia, the international journal from Leuven on Neo-Latin studies, if you look at the Instrumentum Bibliographicum, you will see that there's a part devoted always to Scriptores Scynici. And it is the biggest part. There were so many plays. And these plays in the Renaissance and post-early modern period, they weren't just, they were very popular in the Jesuit colleges, because it was, that's where we got the idea for the Comiticulum of coming up with a, a play. But they were municipal performances. There was a public that knew Latin by ear well enough to appreciate a play like this. This was happening, you know, the Magdeburg you know, City Festival of 1590. There would be a Latin play, often. Uh, so neo-Latin drama. Anyway, we have found some neo-Latin dramas we want to give a modern premiere to. We'll actually put them on. Then there's an attempt to get all the papers published. Um, and I, 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 I can't tell you at this point where we um, are on that. We have been successful in getting some of the funding. So there's no doubt the conference will happen. So Dixie at uh, Nunc Parata Sum Interrogata Vestra Audire. Uh, thank you. This is, is great to uh, have a clear perspective on what this organization is doing and the exciting things that are happening. I was really drawn to the idea that you uh, uh, brought up about how there's this, uh, I don't know if I can call it a divide, but the papers which are didactic and the papers which are more scholarly, perhaps, in orientation. And so as I've gone to these colonial I'm realizing that perhaps most of the papers and publications that I've seen done in Latin tend to be more on the didactic side. And I'm guessing, have you ever seen in your experience someone cite, perhaps, one of these more scholarly articles? Let's just take, for instance, Utopia or whatever. So if someone writes an article pertaining to Utopia, and perhaps someone else like cites one of these articles as they are writing a scholarly work. Have you seen that happen before? Yes, I have. And like even in something that's like written in English or French or German. I have I, I have done this. Uh, I've seen it, and um, I must tell you, the field of neo Latin studies is more open to using Latin because the people they're studying also use Latin as a second language. Yeah. The field of neo Latin studies gets sees more articles published in Latin, but there are some published about classical texts, and there are some journals that will publish them. EOS, um, uh, the Polish journal, uh, the name I forget, maybe that's the one. There are several journals that will accept the Latin articles, and they do get cited. Yeah, it's just uh, like what I, what I find though is that it's almost always more a summary or a kind of just a here's yeah. the idea, but. It, it almost as if it doesn't have like the sort of traction that I'm used to seeing in, mm. let's say, like well, a more standard coffers. Just you, know. uh, you, you haven't probably been reading too much secondary literature on neo-Latin texts, and that's fully understandable because yeah. you're in a department where, again, in America, we tend to think Latin tends to be taught where we only study the ancient period. You know, yeah. Of course, we must study the ancient period, I, and I love the classical authors, but I think we need to study Latin as a world tradition, which it is. Mm -hmm. And the neo-Latin part of it is no less important includes seminal works. Anyway, some of the scholarship on this work is written in Latin, and I will be glad to show you some okay. afterwards. And in fact, the Instrumentum Bibliographicum, which is a strange word, uh, should be conspectus librorum, hoc anno editorum. But anyway, um, in, the, the, in, in, the, in the back of Humanistica, which is the Anne Philologique of Neo-Latin, is, is in Latin, not in French. Mm -hmm. I, I should say that the department which Brian is in is not exclusively made up of people who no, are <laughs> neo-Latin studies. No. And apropos, uh, when in 2017 is the conference set for, and which play, would you want to divulge which play? You well, no, because I would love to, but we, we're, we're, we're kind of torn between several possibilities. Do we don't know yet. Who is an artist? 
No, if you got suggestions, you would, I mean, this could come from, we, well, Moretus, who was a fabulous, he was a, a very interesting character and very instrumental in the origins of the Jesuit order, I might add. A French humanist who taught at Rome and also was a public orator. So we have his both diplomatic and academic speeches. Mostum erat, or professor in initio cursus academici orationem pulcrum latinam aberet, et eius orationes extant. Um, uh, he also composed a play, Julius Caesar, which is an absolute masterpiece of Senecan drama. And it predates the Shakespeare name, which is much better known. But it's not, a, in my opinion, a worse play at all. But it's a Neo-Latin play. So it's just one possibility. But we have four or five we're thinking of. But you would like to propose something? Uh, I will. Yes. <laughs> well, think about it. We'd be glad to hear from you. maybe about 20 years ago, there was this unfortunate division when people said, Motinitatis vive fautores non sunt investigatores. Right. And investigatores non sunt Motinitatis vive fautores. But nowadays, we go to these conferences, and more and more I see that actually, not everybody, but most of the best uh, uh, of the best uh, cultores of Latinitatis vive, those people who want to use Latin uh, as a language of communication, they are also researchers. They uh, are Andreas Fritsch, who's our guest here, has published and many good articles should, in Latin. We should not divide speaking in Latin and the being a philologist. This is the same thing. And I, I, I appreciate Brian's more. question, I really do. And in fact, I was going to answer him that really, Pedagogy is a kind of scholarship too, but, but but I think I know what he's saying. Philology, traditional philology, but it does exist still. It's yeah. a it's a philum tenue, but yeah. with fautores we can build it back up where it should be. Because after all, yeah. it's the language we're studying. But it is dangerous to cultivate speaking Latin uh, um, or trying to speak Latin without really uh, studying Latin uh, in a philological way. It is dangerous because then this would be the end of our profession if people do not read the authors. Right, I agree with Reading, Milena. Speaking with each other, but speaking with the authors first. And um, the tradition is different. Um, and people here must be, and we must go, but one point, further point. Um, what, people here would know more about this than I do. But let me say, Hebrew was a language preserved by the learned rabbis for centuries. And then in 1948, it became the language of the country. And now, if I'm not mistaken, a young Israeli that wants to read biblical Hebrew well has to learn it. That quickly, vernacular language changes. Am I wrong? No, I, I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting because in some ways, the grammar is very similar. But the, and the lexica overlaps, but it's a totally different set of meaning. So if you think of something ubiquitous, like a tank in Israel, a Merkava, um, Merkava is the divine chariot in biblical Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you, you, which is, is really kind of funny in and of itself. But you, you, to do it, aside from a lot of the grammar and, and the idiom, you have to totally readapt your mind to looking at everyday words in a totally different context. So they have to learn it, and conversely, people who, I, I have a friend in Lexington who's a, a very orthodox rabbi, he studied biblical Hebrew from birth, and when he got dropped in, in Israel to go to yeshiva, he couldn't find the bathroom. He, he couldn't ask how to find a bathroom or anything like that, because his, his biblical Hebrew just was not something that they understood. I don't mean to, to stop us, but just to make the point then from that, yeah. so we can go. This never happened to Latin. That's the point. This never happened to Latin, because it never became anybody's national language, but it flourished. It was communicable. Um, but it was stable. It founded new words, but they were more or less recognizable. There are problems about differences in pronunciation, which we read about in the text, but it worked very well as a language that was nobody's native language, but was used and cultivated according to norms that were settled by the autores. So, anyway. Satis superque, the famous. that is obviously based in um, 
Sure. Well, I'm interested in archaeological research. Exactly. And, and things like that that are presented in Latin. Because one of the biggest barriers um, in, in studying archaeology is that there's so many exactly. uh, articles published in different languages. And right. So it would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be nice. <laughs> and so it really nice. would be practical, I believe. Pietro yeah. Roman, Romanelli, who mm-hmm. founded the 1966 yes. yeah. Roman Conference, he's a big name in archaeology. He, he would agree with you. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Uh, Prande Prande Amos. Prande Amos. Thank you, Terry.